when you look at the Buddha's 16 steps for breath meditation, in every case he's telling you to do something. In fact, you train yourself to do something. You very consciously look at your actions and see if they're not in line with what the Buddha recommended. You change them. It's a point that seems so obvious that it, you wonder why you ha would have to mention it. But there are a lot of people out there who teach some very strange things about meditation, that it's not a doing at all. Some of them explain it by saying, there is no self, therefore there's nobody doing anything. There's just causes and conditions. You allow them to happen. Or this evening I heard something new, that trying to interfere with the way things are just going on their own is clinging. So if you stop interfering, there'll be no suffering. Now there is a point in the practice where you apply the perception of not-self to everything. And some people feel that if that's where you're going, might as well start out with that. But you can't start out with that. There has to be a sense of you doing something here. You're the one who's responsible. This is why the Buddha says itself is its own mainstay. It's as if people had the cheat sheet on the Enlightenment test, and they knew all the right answers. Question one is answered with B. Question two is answered with A. They know all the letters for the multiple choices, but they don't really know what the questions are. They don't really know what the answers are. Because if you're going to gain any discernment, you have to look at what you're doing, see where you're causing stress, and then you can change. Some of the change comes from what other people tell you to do. Some of the change has to come from your own powers of observation, because this is going to be your discernment is the factor that's going to make a difference. You can borrow other people's discernment for a bit, but a lot of it depends on your own sensitivity to what you're doing and to the results you're getting from what you're doing. That's how the Buddha himself talks about his own quest for awakening. He tried this, he did this, he developed these qualities. And then he saw that it was lacking. So he figured out what, what else could he do. He went to the two teachers. He put their teachings to the test by putting them into, into practice. He didn't get the results he wanted, even though he had completed that practice to the satisfaction of the teachers. But it wasn't to his own satisfaction. So he tried self-torment. That didn't work. And then he got, finally got onto the right path. It was all trial and error, taking responsibility for his actions. And then when things didn't turn out right, trying to figure out other ways of doing things. Now, if you think the practice is not something you do, you're, not, you're going to miss that opportunity. And who's the you who's doing it? The Buddha doesn't talk too much about that. I mean, you already have a you. All he's asking is that whatever you you have, it's a state of becoming that you've developed. Train it to be competent, train it to be confident that you can do this. That's what the teachings on conceit that Ananda gave to that nun one time were all about. Other people can do this. They're human beings. I'm a human being. If they can do it, why can't I? We ultimately try to get rid of the conceit, but we have to use it first. The same with craving. It's okay to crave awakening. Other people have done it. The fact that they've done it, there's that news that they've done it, and you have a desire to want to have what they've got. It's not they're going to take away what they've got, but you want to have that same attainment. That's a craving that keeps you on the path. So throughout the practice, it's a matter of doing things, using things that you will then have to overcome. So you use your sense of self that at some point you will have to put aside. 
But you do that first through really getting to know the principle of karma. As you're sitting here right now, there's some things you're doing right now that are appearing in the mind. Other things are appearing in the mind that are a result of past actions. So there's some things that are happening in the mind that you don't take responsibility for right now, because they're done. But you do take responsibility for what you do with them. You're sitting here focusing on the breath. Other thoughts may come into the mind. For the time being, you say, nope, not going there. And you do your best to make the breath interesting and to make the skill of meditation interesting. Get some satisfaction not only out of the comfort of the breath, but also out of the fact that you've got some skills and you can use them. There's a real pleasure that comes from mastering a skill. It's not the same as simply having a pleasant sensation. There's a real sense of agency. I mentioned the other day that case of the psychologist who was observing infants and noticed that one of the things that makes them happiest is if they see they can do something and get a result, and they can repeat it and get the same result. They've realized they've figured something out. You do this action, you get that result. That sense of agency makes them really happy. On the other hand, you can think about people in depression. It usually comes from a sense that they've lost their agency. They've tried, tried, tried to find happiness, and they've been stymied in every direction. So they just give up. So a sense of agency is something that really gives happiness to the mind. And what we're doing in the practice is to take that quest for agency and to use it really well, to develop it as a skill. There's a sense of the you who can do these things, the you who's going to benefit from them, and the you who comments on what you've done, notices the patterns, and then begins to judge what kind of actions really are worth doing, which ones are not. Now, for the most part, we've created a lot of suffering that way, things that seem to give rise to happiness, but ultimately don't, or whatever happiness they give rise to stays for a while, laughs in your face, and runs away. And then you're left with the suffering. So the Buddha's not saying, we'll just give up, because that would put you into a depression. He's saying, be more observant. Be clear about what you're doing and the results you're getting. And he gives you some advice as to where to focus your actions, what kinds of actions to try to master. But then he says a lot of it is up to you. This is why he asks for people who are honest and observant and said that the Dharma is nourished by commitment and reflection. You commit to doing it, and then you reflect on it. And then you take your reflections and use that to inform your next action and your next. But pursue this as a skill, because it's in, through pursuing these skills, the skill of mindfulness, the skills of concentration, that you really get to know the principle of karma. Because we're working on a type of karma here that's really special. But it says there's bright karma, there's dark karma. There's a mixture of the two, and then there's karma that's neither. It's the karma that leads to the end of karma. And you're not going to put an end to karma without understanding it, without understanding the principle of cause and effect and seeing exactly how far your agency can go. So instead of having you simply accept that you can't do anything and be okay with that, and dress it up so you forget that it is a kind of mild depression, or sometimes a severe depression. He has you take that process of delighting in your agency, and he says, pursue it. Although use it to delight in abandoning unskillful qualities and delight in developing skillful qualities. That's part of the practice of delight that he recommends. He said, this is how people put an end to the affluence. 
You delight in the Dharma, you delight in abandoning, you delight in developing, you delight in seclusion. You delight in what's harmless. What's really harmless, of course, is nirvana. You delight in, the, I think the term is the unafflicted. And before you get the unafflicted, you delight in the idea of that, that your actions can take you there. You delight in non-objectification, kind of thinking that avoids, avoids conflict or is able to avoid conflict. You delight in the idea that you can find something that is free of conflict. So you're taking your delight in agency and you're applying it in the, in the direction of delighting in the path that will take you to the end of the effluence. But this requires that you actually know the questions and you know the answers. And you realize the question about self and not self is not whether there is or is not a self. You've already assumed one, so you might as well use it. But there will come a point, as you get to see things more and more in terms of actions and their results, that you see your sense of self as a kind of action. And you begin to notice when is it skillful, when is it not. And eventually that pursuit will take you to the point where the perception of not-self does get applied to everything. In other words, you've answered that question, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. That's the question. And the answer is found in doing the practice, committing yourself to it and reflecting on it. This is something the Enlightenment cheat sheet can't tell you. So it requires commitment. A lot of people don't like to hear that. They like to hear, well, they don't have to do anything that can be enlightened. But that's depressing. The Buddha is teaching you a path that leads to the highest happiness. And you do that by pursuing the happiness that you find in mastery and the happiness you find in perfecting that sense of agency, that you really can make a difference. So instead of seeing the attempts to make a difference in things simply as clinging that you've got to abandon, you learn how to be really skillful in how you make a change in things, make a difference in things. And then you reach the point where you can let go of that sense of agency, the voice inside that's telling you what to do. And this is not going to be depressing. The depressing way of Abandoning agency is when you get on the raft and then you get off right away. And you just sit there. You've gone a foot away from the shore on this side, and then you just sit there, soaking up the water, which is very different from taking the raft all the way across and then reaching the point where you don't need the raft anymore. You've reached the freedom of the other side. So this is a path to delight in, and the delight comes from that sense of sense of agency, perfected to the point where you don't need it anymore. It's taking you to the happiness that you want, because after all, that's what agency is all about. You want to find happiness. The situation where you are right now is not happy, or maybe happy in some ways, but it's not satisfying. And so you want to find something better. And the Buddha says there really is something better, and it's something that you can do through your powers of action. Which is why this is a path of delight. So don't listen to the people who would like to hand out a cheat sheet at the door. You really want to master this skill. And that's the only way that you're going to find the real thing.